It is a, uh, just a tremendous honor, um, not only to welcome you here, but also to welcome Michael Lerner here from California. Michael um, is a remarkable human being. Uh, he is a Harvard and Yale trained political scientist. He actually had a tenure track position at Yale um, University, uh, which he left to uh, begin Commonweal. Commonweal is a nonprofit group that incubates and supports programs on health and healing, art and education, and environment and justice. He received a MacArthur Fellowship, which you may know as a MacArthur Genius Grant, um, for his contributions to public health and his work with cancer patients and healing circles has been featured in Bill Moyer's award-winning PBS series, Healing the Mind. Um, just last week, he launched a new website, which is called Beyond Conventional Cancer Therapies. Um, and the URL for that, you can Google it later if you need it, but the URL is bcct.ngo. Um, this is the first comprehensive hub of information on the range of options and support for people impacted by cancer. It is a tremendous resource. I encourage you to check it out. I had the pleasure of hearing Michael speak at the Young Center uh, back in the spring, and I had the great honor of sitting with him this morning, uh, just at sunrise, uh, in a healing circle. For decades, Michael has invited people at some of the most anguished and vulnerable moments of their lives to sit with him and share their experiences. Michael listens with his whole being. How rare that is to be heard so completely and how precious. This is his vocation and this is his sacred gift. Tonight, what he'll share with us emerges from decades of passionate listening. He'll share with us the love that emerges from a life spent witnessing the great mystery of suffering and healing. And I cannot wait to listen to him. Help me welcome Michael. Thank you, Sean, for that beautiful introduction. You know, we, you remind me of a story about the great um, playwright George Bernard Shaw. And he was approached one day by a man who said to him, Mr. Shaw, Mr. Shaw, I have a terrible problem. I've been asked to summarize my whole life work in 40 minutes, and I don't know how I can possibly do that. Do you have any suggestions? And Shaw said, yeah, I have one suggestion. And the man said, oh, please, tell me what it is. And Shaw said, speak very slowly. <laughs> So um, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm grateful to be back in Houston. I love this town. Um, I feel I kind of live in a, a kind of a bubble on the West Coast and that Houston is the real world and that I am grateful to be in the real world. And uh, there's something just so powerfully real about being here that speaks to a part of me that doesn't get to express itself as easily in the West Coast bubble. It's a beautiful bubble, but it's kind of bubbly, you know, so. <laughs> and I want to preface my remarks uh, by offering my deep gratitude to our Healing Circles team in Houston, led by our, my beloved friends David Spa and Susan Rafty and uh, including uh, the remarkable Susan Cooley, who is leading our nurse leadership work, Ed Halloran, Becky Dodds, Helen Spa, Fred Rogers, Kat Denton, and Belle McFarlane. Um, Healing Circles, just to say a word about it, is a international learning community devoted to rediscovering and deepening our birthright gift to be in healing relationship with each other. We draw on many circle traditions, uh, and healing circles can deepen existing circle work or create new circles. We celebrate and embrace all forms of righteous circle work. Healing Circles Houston is one of our
principal anchor partners in this work. And we are blessed by our extraordinary Houston partners, the Young Center, St. Paul's Methodist Church, and the Institute for Spirituality and Health. And we look forward to forging other partnerships with those who either work in circles or would like to and want to deepen the authenticity and power of their work. In other words, we're not, as a learning community, we're not offering a fixed method. We are coming together with people who do circle work or want to do circle work to inquire together what we can learn from each other about deepening the extraordinary opportunities that circles create. Because the simple truth is, we heal in community. That's how we heal. And we heal by the power of love. Whatever form of circle work deepens our ability to love ourselves, to love others, to love more wisely, and become all that we can be in these lives is by definition a healing circle. My colleague Rachel Naomi Remen, whose work some of you know, has often said that perhaps, and remember this if you remember nothing else tonight, that perhaps, that per perhaps the purpose of life is to grow in wisdom and learn to love better. Every word in that is important. The perhaps is important. It isn't an assertion that that's true. Purpose is important. It isn't an assertion that there is purpose. But if there is purpose, then just perhaps the purpose might be to grow in wisdom and learn to love better. And there could be no better introduction than that to my topic tonight, which is a life in love. I have lived these 75 years of my life. I turned 75 on October 22nd in love. I was loved by my father and mother, loved my, by my two younger brothers, and I love them all still, though my parents have passed into the mystery. That love, especially my mother's love, formed me profoundly. Uh, there is a fragment from uh, uh, Raymond Carver, I believe he wrote as he was close to death. It's called Late Fragment, which captures that sense of, uh, of, uh, that I've described from my, my childhood and is with me still at age 75. And did you get what you wanted from this life? Even so. Yes, I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved to feel myself beloved on the earth. And did you get what you wanted from this life? Even so, yes, I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. I have felt that all my life. And for me, the greatest expression of love is the work of service to life because all of us are given, every human being, three things that we just are given. We're given our hearts, we're given our heads, and we're given our hands. And in every great religious and spiritual tradition, this is recognized. Our hearts are to love, and kindness is love with its work boots on. Our heads are to find wisdom. And wisdom is too much to ask of any of us, but just a practical effort to live skillfully is a form of wisdom. And then our hands. Our hands, if, if we don't bring love and wisdom together as best we can in some form of service, they're just empty ideas in our lives. By their fruits shall you know them. By their fruits shall you know them. The fruits are the works of our hand. So each of us, each of us in this room, are given our heads, our hearts, our hands for love, for wisdom, for service. And what we make of this is what our lives will be about. I'll start, I'm going to read you a bunch of poems tonight. I just love poems, and they speak more of love than anything else I can think of. And the first, uh, the Sufi way, is well known in spiritual traditions as the path of love. And here is a poem by one of the greatest Sufi poets, Sufi love poets, Hafiz. We are people who need to love because love is the soul's life. Love is simply creation's greatest joy. 
One regret, dear world, that I am determined not to have when I am lying on my deathbed is that I did not kiss you enough. Your love should never be offered to the mouth of a stranger, only to someone who has the valor and daring to cut pieces of their soul off with a knife, then weave them into a blanket to protect you. I'll read that again. We are people who need to love because love is the soul's life. Love is simply creation's greatest joy. One regret, dear world, that I am determined not to have when I am lying on my deathbed is that I did not kiss you enough. Your love should never be offered to the mouth of a stranger, only to someone who has the valor and daring to cut pieces of their soul off with a knife, then weave them into a blanket to protect you. Jung was, for me, the greatest psychologist of the 20th century. Freud, the great founder of psychoanalysis, is somewhat mistakenly credited with having discovered the unconscious. There were others before him, notably the great German philosopher Nietzsche, as studies by David Law White and Henri Ellenberger and others have demonstrated. Freud won the Nobel Prize in 1915, but not for medicine. He won it for literature. Few remember that. The Nobel Prize for Fiction for Literature is actually deeply appropriate. In some deep sense, the depth psychologies, whether Freudian or Jungian, or the archetypal psychologies of James Hillman and others, can best be described as useful fictions or necessary fictions. They are, in other words, the useful or necessary stories or myths that we tell ourselves in order to make sense of our world. The philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah calls them useful fictions. He says, we can't encompass the whole truth with mental concepts. There is a gap between what is true and what is useful to believe. This is even true, he says, of some scientific principles, which help predict outcomes but aren't always accurate. They aren't strictly true, but they're roughly right, and therefore a useful belief. If we move from the world of science to the world of soul, which we must if we are to explore our lives in love, the recognition that depth psychologies are more than useful fictions, they are necessary fictions, is a help rather than a hindrance. We don't ask these psychologies to predict outcomes. We ask that they help us make sense of our lives. If our stories have been broken by our lives, we ask that they help us find new ways to tell our stories. This is the purpose of psychotherapy, or Alcoholics Anonymous, or Healing Circles, or any other form of intensive self-reflection. In Alcoholics Anonymous, in Healing Circles, in any, uh, in any circle that is based on uh, love and trust and uh, commitment, uh, we, we come to love each other, we come to uh, trust each other, and we see each other into being. We don't offer advice, we don't try to fix people, we don't try to counsel people. We simply witness people, we witness each other so that we can hear ourselves think, so that we can hear our souls begin to express themselves. And through that act of listening, which is one of the greatest gifts you can give another human being, then we witness another human being finding themselves and finding their way into being. Because finding your way into being is a lifelong process. It doesn't end at any point. And in fact, it can accelerate with being wounded or being old or any of those things. So these necessary fictions, psychotherapy, healing circles, church confessionals, religious or spiritual traditions, or whatever they are, help us navigate our small boats through the sea of life. There's a word called kubernesis, which is a Greek word for wisdom, which actually means the steersman of a boat on the seas of life. Kubernesis gives us the modern word cybernetic, which is the science of communication and control systems in both machines and living things. 
So kubernesis or wisdom means the ability to steer ourselves, our organizations and communities through the ever shifting seas and weather of life. We actually find the term kubernesis in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 as one of the fundamental gifts God gives the church. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, then gifts of helping, of guidance, which is kubernesis, and of different kinds of tongues. So it's one of the core dimensions that, um, that God gives to the church. Nothing in our lives is as difficult and as important as steering our small boats through the seas of love, because the other side of love is loss, loss even unto death. Love and loss, love and death, are intimately and profoundly tied together. They are two sides of a single coin. I've uh, co-led the Commonweal Cancer Help Program for 33 years. We've done 202 retreats, and when I get back, we'll do our 203rd week-long retreat. And in the evening on death and dying, here's a poem that I often share with people that many of our alumni know by heart, and many of you know too. It's an excerpt, the last stanza, from Mary Oliver's In Blackwater Woods. <clears throat> to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. To love what is mortal, sorry, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. If you have ever been truly and deeply in love, you know two things. The first is that you would gladly give your life for the person you love. And the second is you might rather die than lose the person you love. And so Mary Oliver's poem is quite precisely right. And that is why it has such power over us. Now I turn to the most difficult part of the talk, which requires the closest attention, which is an excerpt from Jung's great memoir, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. I've shortened it, but it is at the heart of what I have to offer you. So I ask you to listen closely to this part of what I uh, can give you. This is the quote, which I've shortened. In classical times, when such things were properly understood, Eros was considered a god whose divinity transcended our human limits and who therefore could neither be comprehended nor represented in any way. The range of this daimon, Eros, extends from the endless spaces of the heavens to the darkest abysses of hell. I falter before the task of finding the language which might adequately express the incalculable paradoxes of love. Eros is a cosmogonos, a creator and father-mother of all higher consciousness. Whatever the learned interpretation of the sentence, God is love, the, word affir the words affirm the complex of opposites contained within the Godhead. In my medical experience, Jung says, as well as in my own life, I have again and again been faced with the mystery of love and have never been able to explain what it is. No language is adequate to this paradox. Whatever one can say, no words express the whole. Love bears all things and endures all things, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. These words say all there is to be said, nothing can be added. For we are in the deepest sense the victims and the instruments of cosmogonic uh, love. I do, do not use the, t the term love to mean desiring or preferring or favoring or wishing, but as something superior to the individual, a unified and undivided whole. Being apart, man cannot grasp the whole. He is at its mercy. 
He may assent to it or rebel against it, but he is always caught up by it and enclosed within it. He is dependent upon it and sustained by it. Love is his light and his darkness, whose end he cannot see. Man can try to name love, and, but he will involve himself in endless self-deceptions. If he possesses a grain of wisdom, he will lay down his arms and name the unknown by the more unknown, that is, by the name of God. This is a confession of his subjection, his imperfection, and his dependence, but at the same time a testimony to his freedom to choose between truth and error. Jung was profoundly aware, as that passage shows, of the relationship between human and divine love. The Sufi path, as I said at the start, is the path of love, and one of the most profound Sufi sayings is this, the friend with a small f leads to the friend with a large f. Now, the Sufis called the divine the friend with a large f. So the human friend leads to the divine friend. That means that your love for the human friend can lead you to the love of God or whatever you choose to call what is meaningful in your life or whatever, whatever is numinous for you. Forget the term God, but the, the friend with a small f can lead you to that which is greatest that you can find on this earth and in the sky. Have you ever had that experience? I ask each of you that a human love has led you to the experience of universal love. It is for many the most transformational experience in a human life. The eyes are the windows of the soul, it is said. Have you ever looked into the eyes of your beloved and seen your soul mate? Have you ever seen the eternal in the eyes of a baby or young child? As a mother, have you ever looked into your baby's eyes and understood in a new way why you are here? How to respond to transformational love with wisdom, how to steer through transformational love, is one of the most difficult human tasks. Now, sometimes you fall deeply in love with Mr. Wright or Ms. Wright, and you can get married and try to live happily ever after. That's where the film usually ends, the man and woman embracing and the hope of enduring happiness. But what happens to that transcendent experience of soul love after you move in together? James Hillman rightly reminds us that all, we all have a whole bunch of different subpersonalities swimming around in us. And all those subpersonalities are usually unknown to the person we've fallen in love with. And he likens that whole community of, of subpersonalities to a boarding house. And he says there are some members of the boarding house who come out by day and play by the rules and others who come out by night and play by completely different rules. And there are still others who don't come out of their rooms at all. So when you fall in love with somebody, you are both presenting your best selves to each other. But then when you move in with each other, guess what? You brought these two boarding houses together, and you begin to discover not only the day residents, but the night residents, and even the ones that don't come out of their houses at all. So what happens to that experience of transcendent love? You see, that image of transcendent love was based on an archetype of your beloved that stands behind your beloved. So you fell in love with the image that stood behind your beloved and, in fact, that gave you that experience of the numinous because you are in love with an archetype. But the human being is more than an archetype. It, he's a boarding house or she's a boarding house. And so when you actually get together, there's a tension between the archetypal force that you fell in love with, which is manifest in, in your beloved, but nonetheless your beloved is a human being with all these other qualities. So, um, uh, so uh, as we discover all these night walkers and workers in each other's boarding houses, that transformative experience of love begins to shift. It begins to be something else, not something worse, as I will come to, but it begins to shift. Surprisingly often, this experience of transformative love takes place 
with a person who is not available, or available only at very high social and emotional cost. Hillman believes there's a sole reason for this. The agony of impossible love keeps us in the work that the soul requires to continue to deepen consciousness. In other words, both Jung and Hillman felt deeply that consciousness, higher consciousness, only grows through suffering. It only, and so when you find this impossible love, it may be completely agonizing, but what it's doing by being impossible precisely is keeping you in the suffering. Whereas if you got together and got married, you would find another way to suffer, you know, but it's a different path to suffering, right? So um, in the case of impossible love, wisdom is urgently required. We were talking about wisdom as the steersman of the boat. You may feel you need to overthrow marriages and cause grievous harm to dozens of lives. Half of marriages ends in divorce, so this must happen fairly often. But even if you navigate these waters with some skill, what happens to that experience of transcendent love if you actually get together with the impossible person and marry or live together? What happens again is that once you're together, you must face the reality of Hillman's boarding house. Seven years later, or perhaps less, you may well find yourself back where you started with no certainty of being any happier than you were before you fell in love. Then the only choice at that point seems to be to live with what you chose and make the best of it, or to fall in love and start the whole cycle again. There is a third way. That third way is called friendship. It requires great skill, and the skill requires that we recognize that the transcendent experience of love may actually last far longer if you don't come together. This requires the acceptance of profound suffering. There is a beautiful line in a poem that speaks to this. It is the obstructed brook that sings. In other words, the stones in the brook are what causes the brook to sing. It is often the unfulfilled love that lasts, the one that got away, the one you loved in college that you meet again and feel that explosion of young love. In other words, the experience that you are soulmates, instead of diminishing, may paradoxically actually deepen because you cannot live together. Or in the case of young loves that you rediscover, it may deepen because you have not lived together. So you may live your way into something that is often more profound and more lasting than romantic love. You become friends. Have you ever heard somebody say, usually of a second or third marriage, this time I married my best friend? That may actually not be the best way to keep a best friend, but it expresses a deepening wisdom about what makes love last. Now, friendship in many traditions is often seen as a far higher calling than erotic or romantic love. You know, we um, give great precedence to erotic and romantic love in American culture, but in fact, in most cultures in the world, friendship is far more deeply valued. Uh, and it's been more deeply valued in most traditional cultures for thousands of years. It's not that erotic love and friendship are necessarily separate. We know there can be sex without erotic love. It is less recognized there can be erotic love without sex. In psychotherapy, it is often true that deep erotic relationships develop that cannot be ethically acted on, although the history of psychoanalysis is filled with examples uh, when it was acted on, especially in the wild early days of psychoanalysis. I mean, the early days of the Jung Institute you know, all the analysts were sleeping with their patients. And in fact, James Hillman's sin was not that he was one of the analysts that was sleeping with his patients. It was that he got caught and that there was a power block that wanted to drive him out, which ultimately probably turned out very well for James Hillman on psychoanalysis because he probably made a much greater contribution having left the Young Institute than he would have if he stayed. I mean, he was considered by far the most brilliant uh, 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 student that the uh, Jung Institute uh, actually had. So um, uh, 
So what is the real purpose of psychotherapy? It is not to act on the erotic love that a patient and a therapist may feel for each other. It is to use the transference, whatever it is, for higher purpose. And what is the purpose of deep friendship, erotic or not? It is to walk the pilgrimage path of life together, to grow in wisdom and learn to love better. So if you are blessed, and it is a blessing, with a friend with whom you can share anything, and you deeply love that friend, and that friend deeply loves you, and you know it's for life, then that may be the highest form that human love can take, higher than the storm and beauty and amazement of uh, being deeply in love. Robert Marley says it well. He says, the truth is, everyone's going to hurt you. You just got to find the ones worth suffering for. Thomas Aquinas says, what we love tells us who we are. I believe he is speaking not only of our confessed and honorable loves, but of our secret loves, our hidden loves, the ones we may struggle with, at least as much as our confessed and honorable loves. I believe he must include our darkest loves, our darkest addictions, the things we are most ashamed of. These secret hidden loves are what James Hillman calls our boarding houses. Not the ones who come out by day, but the ones who come out by night or the ones who never come out of their rooms at all. If we don't acknowledge and study uh, what Jung calls our shadow, uh, these, uh, these dark hidden loves, these secret loves, grow fiercer and have more power over us. By contrast, if we can find a way to confess our shadow loves, at least to ourselves and preferably to at least one other person, preferably to a friend or a therapist, someone that hopefully you can trust, then uh, we may find that over time, these shadow loves become allies filled with powerful energies instead of opponents. So love, we can see, is an incredibly paradoxical thing. Um, Tom Cheatham, who I believe spoke for you recently here, is a great scholar of Henri Corbin, the great um, uh, scholar of uh, Ibn Arabi, who I'll come back to, once said to me, we we're talking about love, and this is something I just think is so useful. He said, in love is a feeling, love is an act. In love is a feeling. In love is how you make me feel. Love is how I act. So, um, being in love defeats your will and ethic. You're overwhelmed. You can't do what you believe you should do. You are just overwhelmed by the power of love. But acts of love require your will and ethic. In other words, you've made a commitment to something, whether a child or another human being. And guess what? Over time, your in love feelings change. They become much more complicated. Many, many different feelings are going on. Rilke said, no feeling is final. So your feelings are shifting all the time, and yet you've made a commitment. Now, you made that commitment when you were deeply in love. But as a person who has a sense of an ethic, you feel a commitment to continuing to love that person, even if the in love part is over or has changed. So, being in love defeats your will and ethic. The acts of love require your will and ethic. When you love, you direct your will to an act or, uh, in a loving way, often regardless of your feelings. So you may have all kinds of complicated feelings about your child or your partner or your parent or whoever it is, but you're committed to loving them. And so that love is directed not by a feeling, but by your will. Now, remember, there are three parts of us, the love of our hearts, the wisdom of our mind, and the will of our hand. So we take the love of our hearts and the wisdom of our minds, and we bring them together, and then we express them through acts. So love is an act of will in that sense. And what you hope and what can actually happen is that your feelings will, more of the time than not, align 
with your intention to love so that you move into a deep, quiet, mature love that is expressed by a commitment of the will. And at the same time, your feelings begin to align behind them. You know, I often think, my wife and I have been married 33 years, and I said to her the other day, I said, I said to her, you know, I think one of the greatest experiences of love is uh, to annoy each other as little as possible. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's a real gift. I mean, if you can be in the house with another human being and just, not, just manage not to annoy each other, you know? I mean, that's love, you know? That's love. So when you love, you hope and pray your feelings, which may be profoundly ambivalent, will align behind your will. Sometimes they will and sometimes they won't. But hopefully you find a way of living together that enables you to do that more often than not. So this complexity of love. Here's a poem by Rilke which many of you know call, from Letters to a Young Poet, which speaks of the awesome task of loving another human being with all our complexity, with all our boarding houses, with all that we each bring to it. For one human being to love another, that is perhaps the most difficult task of all. The work for which all other work is but preparation it is a high inducement to the individual to ripen, a great claim upon us, something that chooses us out and calls us to vast things. For one human being to love another, that is perhaps the most difficult task of all. The work for which all other work is but preparation, it is a high inducement to the individual to ripen, to mature. A great claim upon us, something that chooses us out and calls us to vast things. What are the vast things? What chooses us out? Remember that quote from Jung. We're in the power of love. We are the victims of love. And yet, by what we love, by who we love, we somehow become what we were intended to be. We are called out, and the vast things may be that experience of the numinous, not in the uh, dramatic form of being in love, which gives us such extraordinary access to the transcendent, but the quiet, patient work of loving another human being for long periods of time. The greatest of the Sufi philosophers was Ibn Arabi, the subject of the French religious historian Henri Corbin's great book called Alone with the Alone, which has a beautiful introduction by the great Yale literary critic Harold Bloom. I love this poem, and I, I read it at St. Uh, Paul's uh, yesterday, but I'll read it again. O marvel, a garden amidst the flames, my heart has become capable of every form it is a pasture for gazelles and a convent for Christian monks, a temple for idols and the pilgrim's Kaaba, the tables of the Torah and the book of the Koran. I follow the religion of love. Whatever way love's camels take, that is my religion and my faith. He wrote that about 1200 AD. Ibn Arabi offers us a profound understanding of what it means to see God as love. For if God loves all human beings equally, and we love God and his creation, then perhaps growing in wisdom and learning to love better will open our hearts to all traditions, not just our own. So, I want to say a few words about myself. Um, I had a heart attack about 
mm, when I was uh, 59. I'm 75 now, and I've had an easy time with my heart for a long time. It's been very good to me. And this summer, I began to experience when I was swimming and things, uh, my heart pounding. And uh, it happened when I walked uphill or when I felt very stressed. And so I thought something was going on. And I worked with my physician, who's a great internist, uh, integrative medicine specialist, a functional medicine specialist, and a remarkable intuitive healer. And um, I also went to see my cardiologist. And right now, I'm wearing something called an event monitor, so that if it happens, it'll get recorded. And um, I don't know what's going to happen. I have an echocardiogram in another uh, week. And um, I've done the Cancer Health Program for 33 years. I've talked to other people about death and dying for 33 years. But it's different when it comes around to you. you know? It's different when you feel that sense of vulnerability that you don't know. See, the interesting thing about heart conditions as opposed to cancer is that cancer, typically, you have a long time. And with your heart, you never know. You know, this might be my last talk. I don't know. But it made me determine that whether this was my last talk or not, that I would say what I would want to say if it were my last talk. And I wanted to talk about love. And um, and I want you to experience this, each of you, yourselves, tonight. What it means in each of our lives, how we hold love. You know? Is it a static thing? kind of a routine? Or is it this wild thing that we can't control? We try to be as kind as we can be. We can't control who we fall in love with. We can't control if we're married and there's some other human being that we deeply love. We just can't control it. But what we can do is try to be a little wiser than we were before. Now, what we can do is try to be a little more skillful. What we can do is try very hard not to hurt anybody. Um, my whole life has been about taking the love that my mother gave me and turning it into works of service. That's what Commonweal does. But it's also been about experiencing the power of love myself. I think the more love you receive as a child, the more you're able, everybody knows this, to love yourself and love others better. I was given such gifts. I'm a freak of nature, you know, a child with a happy childhood who was loved by both parents. So I was given that gift, and I've, I've wanted to try to give it back. I'll close um, with another poem by Hafiz, and then we may have some time for questions and answers. And this is my favorite Hafiz poem. I'll read it twice. It's called In a Treehouse. Light will someday split you open, even if your life is now a cage. For a divine seed, the crown of destiny, is hidden and sown on an ancient fertile plain you hold the title to. Love will surely bust you wide open into an unfettered, blooming new galaxy, even if your mind is now a spoiled mule. A life-giving radiance will come, the friend's grace. Remember, the friend is the divine in this. 
The friend's grace will come. Oh, look again within yourself, for I know you were once the elegant host to all the marvels and creation. From a sacred crevice in your body, a bow rises each night and shoots your soul into God. Behold the beautiful, drunk, singing one from the lunar vantage point of love. He is conducting the affairs of the whole universe while throwing wild parties in a treehouse on a limb in your heart. I'll read that one more time. There's a lot in that. Because notice, before I read it, it starts, light will be will split you open, and then love will burst you wide open. And then from a sacred crevice in your body, a bow rises and shoots. So what have you got? Light, wisdom, love, the heart, the bow, the hands. So again, you know, in, in uh, the midst of this, uh, there are many uh, deep, deep um, symbols and energies that uh, we can only begin to explore. Light will someday split you open even if your life is now a cage. For a divine seed, the crown of destiny, is hidden and sown on an ancient fertile plain you hold the title to. Love will surely burst you wide open into an unfettered blooming new galaxy, even if your mind is now a spoiled mule. A life-giving radiance will come. The friend's grace will come. Oh, look again within yourself, for I know you were once the elegant host to all the marvels in creation. From a sacred crevice in your body, a bow rises each night and shoots your soul into God. Behold the beautiful drunk singing one. This is the friend. Behold the beautiful drunk singing one from the lunar vantage point of love. Not the solar vantage point, but the lunar vantage point of love. He is conducting the affairs of the whole universe while throwing wild parties in a treehouse on a limb in your heart. So that's where we are, friends. That's where we are. Each of you in this room. Each of you that light will someday split you open, that love will surely bust you wide open, that a life-giving radiance can come to you, the friend's grace can come to you. If we look within ourselves, we can discover we were once the elegant host to all the marvels in creation. That's because we contain the divine within ourselves. From that sacred crevice in our bodies, a bow rises each night and shoots our souls into God. It happens every night if we pay attention. And what is the friend doing? He's conducting the affairs of the whole universe while throwing wild parties in a treehouse on a limb in our hearts. Thank you.